Good morning. I'd like to thank Mike and Roberta for allowing me to speak this morning, and I also truly would like to thank Roberta for accommodating my schedule. And it is my mother's birthday tonight, so I'm glad I can get back on time. We're going to talk about, this is going to sort of be a bridge between what you've heard in the last two days and what you're hearing today. We're going to look at volume as being the really most important thing, in my opinion, when you look at most aging faces. And you've heard it through the ideas of fillers. You've heard the ideas of fat. I'm going to touch upon both, but principally fat. We have to first understand what defines a youthful face. And that may sound a little ludicrous, but if you look at a lot of people where they just, in an a priori fashion, decide to lift brows, cut skin, pull faces, and not really start to look back at what exactly constitutes a youthful face, we oftentimes don't get closer, we get farther. And also, what's so important is you're going to hear me, what I'm talking about today is using the old photographs of the patient as a blueprint and, and as a guide to understand what did that patient used to look like? Where were the brows? What was the cheek look like, looking like? What was the neckline looking like? So you, you know that principally to break it down, there are obviously wrinkles, gravity, and volume. As surgeons, we probably look at gravity, and as, as dermatologists, probably looking at wrinkles. But there's this intersection, which is volume, and I think volume is so critical. It's really become the cornerstone to everything that I do. So. Let's talk about a new theory. I don't claim originality here, but I, was, I really merged some of what Dr. Donofrio and Dr. Glasgow have done and then just put it through this more intricate idea of looking at geometry. And I, This is the first time I'm presenting this information. If we look at a child, the child, for the most part, is a circle. And that's the idea that there's this simple geometry behind that face that allows us to make an immediate idea of what that person's age is before we can even look at wrinkles or gravity from a close range. Further on, as you're a teenager, that still maintains a very strong circular pattern. Of course, there are differences in people that are thinner, overweight, etc. But in general, there's a circular element to a teenage face. In our early 20s, we also maintain that circle. And that's that evolution that maintains itself until we get about the time in their mid-20s. And what you're starting to see at this point is some of the baby fat beginning to disappear, but not quite yet. So you're getting principally a circle. With a, a, with a little bit of the hint of that triangle coming through that heart-shaped face we talk about. As we get into our late 20s, the triangle begins to dominate, but the circle is still there. There's still fullness to that face. And that's also part of that evolution, is just beginning to transition over into the early to mid-30s, where we see that triangle. And if you, this is what's interesting, is that most women, and I, bet, I say about 80%, would look at themselves and say they look the best in their early to mid-30s because there is a triangle. Some of that baby fat, which they conceptualize as being fatty or fat, is really something that they don't oftentimes like. And there's a sculpted look in the early to mid-30s. As we get into the late 30s and early 40s, there's a squaring off where that, what Dr. Lam was talking about, that the loss of volume into the mid-face just begins to start happening. And you start to get a little bit more dominance in the lower face, especially after some children, you may gain a few pounds. And so that begins to look like more like a, a, a square. As you get into the mid-40s and beyond, you start becoming still a square, but you get even more volume down here and more flattening of the upper mid-face. And, and I think what we're really looking at today is it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We don't have to do everything through volume, everything through suspension, everything through skin treatments. It's an amalgam of all that. I think if you look at where we're going and listening to Dr. Brandy and listening to Dr. Little, there's this consensus that the lower face is principally a suspensory element and the upper to mid-face is more volume. But there is an intersection where still lifting is important for the upper face and volume is still important for the lower face, but to a lesser extent. And that lower face starts to dominate. And as we get further, there's, this is obviously excessive, but into the 60s and 70s, we truly get a lot of loss around the eyes. And you know, if you ask yourself in, in an extreme case like this, what would you brow lift? What would you cut? What, what, what steatoblephron is there? What are you going to take away? It, it, there's, there's nothing left, and the lower face dominates. So we need to bring that back. You heard Dr. Little use the idea of an egg inversion. So this is just a different way of looking at that same idea. So what are we trying to do? Really, this is what Dr. Donofrio talks about, is inverting the triangle, getting it back toward a heart-shaped face or triangle, not necessarily a circle. But what's interesting, there was an article in the New York Times that came out, and they looked at where our modern, current conception, conceptions of beauty and ideal beauty are, and they're really closer to almost like a pubescent shape, which is maybe frightening to some. And that may be more of a male-dominated perspective, I don't know. But that's interesting that we're looking more toward a 
teenage to early 20s is an ideal beauty. But if you're working mainly to, to cater to women, they're not wanting that. If you talk to them, they say, come on, please, this is not what I'm looking for. It's just an idea just to have you conceptualize. So let's look at someone who's in her 50s and ask ourselves, why does she look so good? And if we start from the brow complex, the brow is tremendously low and full. It's almost the antithesis of what we think about brow rejuvenation is all about. We think about brow needing to go up, higher, sculpted, and, and even I don't even do the little tempor temporal plasties anymore or, or brow lifts. I, I really like a low, full brow in probably the majority of patients, about 95%. If you can see that eyelid is actually hanging over the eye itself, but it looks tremendously youthful. And you have to start questioning. Go back and look at some textbooks. And these, these are the textbooks I ask you to consult. Glamour, Allure, and Vogue. Because those are ideals of what we as a society look at as beautiful, not the textbooks that we have in terms of before and afters. And if you look at that, what I call the frame to the eye, there's a tremendously lush frame around the eye. And that frame begins evacuation over a period of time. There's that beautiful heart-shaped face, and there's a very similar shaped face if you look at her in her 30s. It just was a little bit fuller, a little bit closer to that circle. And if you look at, obviously, an extreme, obviously there's beautiful browless we've seen, beautiful work. I'm not here to denigrate anything out there. This would be an extreme example of a lot of skin and fat removed and a brow lift. And if you think about it fundamentally, this has actually advanced the age further because that evacuation loss around the frame of the eye is the hallmark of aging. And what we interpret as actual as, as hanging, dermatocalasis and brow ptosis oftentimes is deflation. So just to rethink it, and we're going to go through some of my before and afters to have you understand this. So it's really focusing on facial shape as the cornerstone of what I see as the aging process. And really out of anything in the world, if the eyes look tired, we've done extremely little to rejuvenate a patient. Go back and look at the gestalt, look at the whole face, and don't, don't micromanage the face. Look at the whole thing and say, that, that person actually looked better. And the, and the cornerstone really is making those eyes really, really pop. So part of it is patient re-education. Re Almost every single female that comes into my practice starts with this move. Doctor, this bothers me right here. Because they think that is what ages them, and that's what they've been trained to think. It's a little bit of wrinkles around the mouth. It's a little nasolabial fold. And, and that's oftentimes not the case. And the reason is, you have to understand, is from a male perspective, why we don't get it, is that when makeup is applied, they're extremely close to the mirror. And so every little minor cutaneous flaw becomes the importance for them. But it doesn't make them look better after I fill these tiny little folds. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But we have to start looking at a, going back and going, what is the impact? Oftentimes, my analysis of the patient starts at five feet. I rarely get up and close and try to look at what little things are because they are not that important for overall. So it's a patient re-education that's so important. And then starting with the old photographs, as I was hinting at. So this, as you've probably heard before, I give credit to Dr. Nye, came up with this idea that when we're young, we're a grape. Over time, we become a raisin. So why should you take that raisin, cut, pull, stretch it, and lift it until it becomes a pea? Because a pea doesn't look like a grape. A grape looks like a grape. Obviously, a reduction of philosophy, but one that helps you sort of encapsulate the thinking here. So we're going to talk about some of the technical details. For those that want to uh, do this procedure, as you know, I have a book out there that goes through more detail. This is from, the, from my textbook, for the book, and it just shows you really the key. And you see a lot of it is just around the eyes and a little bit of pre-jowl, but really around the eyes and cheeks. That's your home run. That's where if you do a facelift, if, you do, if you're in a surgical practice, this is going to get you really closer to a magical result where it's just a wow. That's what I'm shooting for. Not like, okay, technically it's better. It's just a wow. And these are refinements, and all this is in the book, is just idea of where, little things that you could add on if you wanted to to get a little bit more of a result, and based on some of those aesthetic principles that you develop and that eye you develop over time. And then some areas that you may want to be careful with, like the temple, and really feeling if someone's been over-resected in the upper eyelid, areas that are a little bit more scarred down and difficult to achieve, consistently smooth uh, results with. So, you know, what's interesting is that we're very visual people, right? Most of us are. But what's amazing with fat, for the most part, it's tactile. So I want to pull you away from this, is that it's going to be using the skull landmarks in your non-dominant hand as your principal guide, and then feeling where you are, and visualizing in your head more than what you see oftentimes. 
And that's very, very important. So this is just a schematic uh, that's also in the book that just helps you conceptualize the layers. There are three principal layers, deep superperiosteal injections, which are around the eye, and then sort of this general mid-subcutaneous deep fascial injection, and then sort of in the general lighter uh, superficial subcutaneous planes. So public care is easy. There are no dressings. There, there are nothing you, 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 you put on, no, su no sutures. I don't close any of these little stab incisions. Um, just using some ice and reducing your salt in, in, in Valsalva and excessive bending over. And then you can actually um, work out any of the areas you harvest because it's such